1 Corinthians 11 3 but I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ the head of the woman is man the head of Christ is God now as I read through these things it is amazing to me how clear the Bible is that there is a distinction of roles that is seen at least in the family in a moment I'm going to show you why those distinctions of roles in the family transition to the church but what's incredible to me is how I have heard a, a number of supposed scholars and philosophers take these verses and say I know it says that but it doesn't really mean what it looks like it says now that's true in some verses I know occasionally when teaching different doctrinal truths there'll be a difficult passage you must explain the rich man and Lazarus only appears once in the Bible you gotta explain the thief on the cross that only appears once in the Bible there's some things that are difficult and you need to compare scripture and scripture let the Bible interpret itself but if you're looking at a whole kaleidoscope of scriptures and say none of them mean what they look like they say then maybe the scriptures don't need to change but our point of view needs to change or if you say they're much too complicated for the average person to understand really that's not what Jesus tells us God so loved the world that He gave His Son. God gave of His Son. God sent His Son. God sent His only begotten Son. God testified of His Son. God spoke by His Son. God said concerning His Son. God has given us life in His Son. God has glorified His Son. That God's glory might glorify the Son. God reconciled us by the death of His Son. God conforms us to the image of His Son. God was pleased to reveal His Son. God sent forth His Son. We worship God and wait for His Son. God raised up His Son. God called us into the fellowship of His Son. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Seventh-day Adventist church members hold your leaders, pastors, local churches, educators, institutions, and administrative organizations accountable to the highest standards of belief based on a literal understanding of Scripture. Again, we read in Selected Messages, Book 1, on page 170, we must be careful lest we misinterpret the scriptures. The plain teachings of the word of God, of God are not to be so spiritualized away or spiritualized that the reality is lost sight of. Do not overstrain the meaning of sentences in the Bible in an effort to bring forth something odd in order to please the fancy. Take the scriptures as they read.
Again, we read in Selected Messages, Book 1, on page 170, we must be careful lest we misinterpret the scriptures. The plain teachings of the word of God are not to be so spiritualized away or spiritualized that the reality is lost sight of. Do not overstrain the meaning of sentences in the Bible in an effort to bring forth something odd in order to please the fancy. Take the scriptures as they read. The historic biblical beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church will not be moved. The, biblic the biblical foundation will stand secure to the end of time. Listen to what we are told in Selected Messages, Book 1, pages 207 to 208. What influence is it that would lead men at this stage of our history to work in an underhand powerful way to tear down the faith, the foundation of our faith, the foundation that was laid at the beginning of our work by prayerful study of the word and by revelation. We, continuing to quote, we are God's commandment keeping people. Every phase of heresy has been brought to bear upon us to becloud our minds regarding the teaching of the word especially concerning the ministration of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary and the message of heaven for these last days as given by the angels of the 14th chapter of Revelation. Messages, and I'm still quoting, messages of every order and kind have been urged upon Seventh-day Adventists to take the place of the truth which point by point has been sought out by prayerful study and testified to by the miracle working power of the Lord, but the way marks which have made us what we are are to be preserved, and they will be preserved as God has signified through his word and the testimony of his spirit. He calls upon us to hold firmly with the grip of faith to the fundamental uh, principles that are based upon unquestionable authority, and I end quote. Go forward, not backward. Another reason that I think this um, is very important, it's not supported by Seventh-day Adventist history. It's interesting that 30 years ago, virtually all of the professors in our seminaries all were united that only men should be ordained as pastors. Now, 60 or more percent are saying it doesn't really matter. My question is, what changed in the last 30 years? Did the Bible change? Did the truth change or did the culture change us? So that we're reading the Bible now with different spectacles on and you can make it say whatever you want if you read it through the spectacles of culture. Let me read to you, this is from, you've heard of uh, J.A. Wagner, one of the leaders in their church. He was the editor for the Signs of the Times. This is an official magazine of the church that Ellen White endorsed and read. It was sent around. And this is uh, December 19, 1878. The divine arrangement, even from the beginning, is this, that man is the head of the woman. Every relationship is disregarded or abused in this lawless age. He thought it was bad back then. 
But the scriptures always maintain this order in the family relation. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Ephesians 5.23 Man is entitled to certain privileges which are not given to woman. And he is subjected to some duties and burdens from which the woman is exempt. A woman may pray, prophesy, exhort, and comfort the church, but she cannot occupy the position of a pastor or ruling elder. This would be looked upon as usurping the authority over the man which is prohibited in the scriptures. Now, if Ellen White had ever said, Oh, Wagner, what in the world are you saying? Why did. Quite the opposite. She highly endorsed these things. This was our history. It wasn't until the last 25 years ago that this started to change. J. H. Wagner, the father of E. J. Wagner, observed two different extremes. Speaking of Orthodox Christians, he said, they take the denial of a trinity to be equivalent to a denial of the divinity of Christ. Were that the case, we should cling to the doctrine of a trinity as tenaciously as any can, but it is not the case. Much stress is laid on Isaiah 9-6 as proving a trinity. The advocates of that theory will say that it refers to a trinity because Christ is called the everlasting Father. If so, how is he the Son? Or if he is both Father and Son, how can there be a trinity? for a trinity is three persons. To recognize a trinity, the distinction between the Father and the Son must be preserved. Christ is called the second person in the trinity, but if this text proves a trinity, or refers to it at all, it proves that he is not the second, but the first. And if he is the first, who is the second? There were some very early that turned the doctrine of Trinity into tritheism, and instead of three divine persons, brought in three collateral, coordinate, and self-originated beings, making them three absolute and independent principles, which is the most proper notion of three gods. The great mistake of Trinitarians in arguing this subject is this. They make no distinction between a denial of a trinity and a denial of the divinity of Christ. They see only the two extremes between which the truth lies. He calls upon us to hold firmly with the grip of faith to the fundamental uh, principles that are based upon unquestionable authority. And I end quote. Go forward, not backward. First Corinthians 11:3. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is man, the head of Christ is God. Now as I read through these things, it is amazing to me how clear the Bible is that there is a distinction of roles. Now we've all read that text in Genesis where it speaks about the image of God. Genesis 1 verse 26 says, Then God, Ellen White identifies this person as the Father, Then God said, She says he's speaking to his Son, Jesus Christ. Then God said, Let us make man, How? in our image according to our likeness. Now we usually think of the image of God as an individual thing. Adam was made in the image of God physically, mentally, and spiritually. Eve was made in the image of God physically, mentally, and spiritually. We think of the image of God as an individual thing, but really what Genesis 1.26 is explaining is that the relationship between Adam and Eve was to reflect the relationship between the Father and the Son. It was an exhibition on a smaller scale of the relationship between the Father and the Son. Let's take a look at the relationship between Adam and Eve. 
the creation story makes it very clear that Adam and Eve were two distinct persons because we are told they will no longer be two but one. They were two individuals just like the Father and the Son are two. And yet we are told in the creation story that God pronounced Adam and Eve the two what? One in the sense of unity, in the sense of closeness and intimacy. They were two but one, like the Father and the Son are two but one. Adam and Eve stood on a level of equality. They were equally human. And both are referred to with the generic word man. Eve was not a lesser order of humanity. She was as much human as Adam was human, just like the Son was as much God as the Father is God. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 46, Ellen White explains, Eve was created from a rib taken from the side of Adam, signifying that she was not to control him as the head, nor to be trampled under his feet as an inferior, but to stand by his side as an equal to be loved and protected by Him. Just like the Father and Son are equal, both God, Adam and Eve were created equal, both human. There was a special intimacy between Adam and Eve. Eve, so to speak, was taken from the bosom of Adam. In fact, you know in Deuteronomy chapter 13 and verse 6, the wife is called the wife of thy bosom. Interestingly enough. So just as the son is in the bosom of the father, Eve was in the bosom of Adam. Ellen White explains in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 46, Eve was created from a rib taken from the side of Adam. That's pretty close to the heart. It's pretty close to the bosom signifying that she was not to control him as the head, nor be trampled under his feet as an inferior, but to stand by his side as an equal to be loved and protected by him. Eve, because she was taken from Adam, was in the image of Adam. Of course, she was in the image of God through Adam. Just like Jesus, the Son is the image of the Father. Just like Jesus is the second self of the Father, Eve was the second self of Adam. In the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 46, Helen White explains, a part of man, bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, she was his second self, showing the close union and the affectionate attachment that it should exist in this relation. Eve was also co-substantial with Adam. She was flesh of his flesh and bone of his bones. Just the like son is co-substantial with the father. In fact, Adam said in Genesis 2.23, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. The woman was also the glory of man like the son is the glory of the father. In fact, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7, For a man indeed ought not cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. Are you seeing the parallels? Amazing parallels. The last parallel, parallel also holds true. Even though Adam and Eve were created equal, Eve was created to be subject to the authority of Adam. We don't like that. Because the word authority is a nasty little word. The word submission is a nasty little word. Because we live in a sinful world and we look at those negatively. But the Bible does not. Jesus was subject to his parents. That wasn't a bad thing. That was a good thing. The word submission is used in a positive sense in Scripture as long as it follows God's plan. And so Adam was created to be the head and Eve 
was to be subject to the leadership of Adam. Scripture presents numerous examples of the father-son relationship, a divine pattern that affects every aspect of life. The pattern is seen throughout the Bible. There is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things. The father-son pattern begins with the Father, who is the source of all things. One God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. He is the Father, the only true God. Blessed be the God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Father. The Father who alone hath immortality. The pattern continues through the Son, who is the channel of all the Father gives him. The Father has life in himself and he has given to the Son to have life in himself, the same immortal, eternal, everlasting life. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. The Father raises up the dead and quickens, gives life to them. He is the original source of all life, and because he has given this original life to his Son, Jesus can raise the dead and give life to whomever he will. It is the voice of the Son of God that will raise the dead to life immortal. Not only immortal life, but the Father gives His Son all things. All things are delivered into my hands, Jesus said. For the Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hands. God has given Him a name that is above every name. All power, authority, is given unto me in heaven and in earth, Jesus said. God, even the Father, hath put all things under his feet. As the Son of the Father, he is appointed heir of all things. He is the channel by whom and through whom all things from the Father flow to his creation. The of whom gives to the by whom who gives life to us, his children. This is the pattern of life from the beginning. God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, said to his Son, Let us make man, mankind, Adam in the Hebrew. Then the Son made man after their image. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them. In the image of God he made man. Men have been made in the likeness of God. At the beginning he made them male and female. Adam was first formed, and Adam was at first alone. Then as God had named all things in heaven, he appointed Adam the task of naming everything on earth. But then God said, it is not good that man should be alone. So woman came forth out of man as part of his very own body. And the Lord God took one of Adam's ribs and closed up the flesh and made a woman and brought her to the man. Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man and they shall be one flesh. Eve was formed, fashioned and made in Adam's likeness. Adam was the source of whom Eve came forth, was brought forth. The woman, Paul said, is from the man. Adam, the only human not begotten, Eve, the only human begotten from another human's side. She was not created from nothing, but was taken out of Adam's side, his bosom. She existed essentially in Adam, a part of him, before she was taken out. She became the express image of Adam. So also the Word is the unique Son of God, begotten of the Father, taken from his bosom, his side. And Adam named his wife Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Adam was the source, Eve was the channel, by whom 
through whom Adam became the father of our race. Eve was the same substance as Adam. They were both equal in nature. She was just as human as he was, but Eve was begotten in a different manner than all other human births. So too the Son of God was begotten of his Father. They both have the same divine substance, both equal in nature. Christ is just as divine as his Father. But the Son was begotten in a different manner, in eternity, than he was later born of Mary in time. Adam and Eve were essentially the same age. Both appear on day six. Father and Son are essentially of the same age. Both are from eternity. As Adam begat Eve, the Father begat Christ, and Christ begets us, giving us his spirit as Adam gave his rib. We are part of Christ. We partake of his divine nature. We are born again, Christ in us. We have his character. As Adam and Eve were one flesh, so also the Father and the Son are one spirit.